you know, look through this. So uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you for joining us. This is the sixth in the webinar series from the MCCN Explore team. Today's focus will be neuroophthalmology, specifically the afferent pathway. Uh, today's host is Mr. Ali Yegan, he's a consultant ophthalmologist at the Royal uh, Eye Hospital in Manchester with an interest in neuro, uh, neuroophthalmology. Uh, just before we start, just some housekeeping. Um, if you have any questions, just type them up in the chat and we'll try and address them at the end or raise your hand. Uh, we would ask that you try and keep your microphones on silent as well. Um, and at the end of the talk, we will release a link for a survey, which would be grateful if you could complete, just helps us to learn and improve. So without any further ado, I'll hand you over to Mr. Ali Yegan. Thanks, John. Thank you for the invite. Uh, and I hope this is a useful evening for all. Um, I'm sorry to bore you with neuroophthalmology for about an hour or so. Um, so my name is Ali Yagan. I work as a consultant neuroophthalmologist at the Eye Hospital in Manchester. Um, we'll talk today primarily about the swollen optic nerve and with some, some reference to the visual pathway as a whole. Um, so why, why we're concerned about this? Um, let's go through the slides. Bit of acknowledgement. Um, you know, I'm, I'm from Syria and this is the, 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 where I work at the moment at the Eye Hospital. Um, ophthalmology is a bit tricky to, to write, never mind to understand. So um, I'll try to make it as, as simple and easy to understand as possible. Um, so the afferent pathway, we, we focus on it because in fact, as, as neuroophthalmologists, it makes up about 60 to 70% of our workload in neuroophthalmology. There is lots of you know, swollen optic nerves, concerns about um, unexplained visual loss, things like that. And we get quite a few of referrals from, from outside the eye hospital and from colleagues in the eye hospital itself uh, for things that, you know, you can't see it straight away in, in ophthalmic examination. So by definition, it kind of falls into neuroophthalmology. Um, people assume that, you know, looking at the optic nerve is easy and the, 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 the things that you'll find there are easy to spot and understand, but it's not always that simple, unfortunately. It's usually difficult to diagnose, although you can see the problem with the optic nerve, it's usually difficult to understand why this is happening because what the optic nerve can do when it's you know, affected by acute insult is usually only swelling, it can't do anything else. But there is lots and lots, and lots of, of causes that you kind of need to do lots of usually very expensive investigations to try to understand uh, what, what you're looking at. And I think one of the primary aims of this talk today is to try to have a structural approach to optic neuropathies and where you can, you, you still need to investigate, but you kind of targeted investigation rather, rather than you know, widespread uh, blanket investigation and hope that you'll catch up something. Uh, so Obviously, majority of us know the anatomy of the optic nerve. It starts from the back of the eye. It's the culmination of the nerve fiber layer from the ganglion cells at the back of the eye. Uh, and, and it travels through the orbit. There is four segments, ocular segment or intraocular segment, and then the orbital, then intracanalicular, and then intracranial segments. It's the only uh, cranial nerve that's, that's surrounded by the meninges and with CSF cuff around it, and that makes it part of the CNS rather than part of the peripheral uh, uh, nerves. Uh, so a couple of pictures, as you can see here. Let's see if we can show you on my screen. So that's the optic nerve traveling from the back of the eye, blood supply to the optic nerve, and it travels through the orbit all the way to the uh, optic canal and then into the intracranial space. And these are the segments with the length, relative lengths of each one of them. And as you all know, uh, both optic nerves go to the optic chiasm where there is a, a halfway kind of dissociation. So only the nasal fibers cross over to the other side while the temporal fibers stay on the same side. And that's really important because it helps us understand the visual field defect that can happen from uh, neurological causes of optic neuropathy. So problems like that affect the 
uh, chiasm can, can cause bitemporal hemianopia, problems that affect the visual pathway behind the chiasm. So the opet, uh, optic tract or, or the optic radiation would usually cause hemianopic field defect. And if you look at the, the face of the optic nerve when we look at it, uh, each segment of the optic nerve is responsible for part of the uh, peripheral vision. Uh, so on, on the cross section, the temporal part of the optic nerve usually feeds the macular area, while the nasal part, for example, feeds uh, the nasal part of the peripheral vision. Uh, because of the lens inside the eye, the upper part of the nerve is responsible for the lower part of the visual field and vice versa. And again, the blood supply of the optic nerve that comes usually from the posterior communicating arteries, which are tiny vessels that surrounds the optic nerve, like this one and this one, and then they branch and feed the optic nerve. While these two big vessels, one is the artery and the other is the vein, they are the retinal arteries and they are not responsible, in the majority of cases, not responsible for, for the blood supply to the optic nerve, but mainly to the retina itself. Nowadays, we depend on, on this OCT scan, and for, for non-ophthalmologists, it's something that might not be familiar with, but OCT scan is, is something that we do day in, day out. It's, it's a significant instrument that helps us understand the structure of the optic nerve and find uh, you know, any subtle abnormalities. And essentially, what it does, it gives you a, a cross-section through the optic nerve using light rather than using ultrasound. So uh, on this example, this is a completely normal optic nerve. You can see the picture of the back of the arm of the fundus, clear margin of the optic nerve. And this green light, the cross section here is through the retinal layers. And you can see that the, there is what you call a cup in the center and the layers of the retina. Uh, and then what, the, what this machine also does, it compares this, this nerve fiber layer of this patient around the optic nerve with the general population. So you get this wheel of, of green lines suggesting that this is completely normal. And again, another example where here you can see that this machine is measuring the thickness of the nerve fiber layer of the optic nerve and comparing it with the general population. So the black line is where the patient is and the comparison is with, with the general population and obviously green is normal. So, what does the optic nerve serve? It, it has primarily four functions, the visual acuity or the central visual acuity where you, know, you can test on the Snellen chart and, and things like that. Uh, the color vision, uh, the peripheral vision or what we call a field tests and the pupil reaction. So let's drill through these one by one. Uh, central vision, it helps us as ophthalmologists to understand that uh, it, so so when, when you get these patients and you don't really know whether it's, it's a, an eye problem, a macular problem, or an optic nerve problem, usually the assessment of the visual functions can help. So for example, uh, optic nerve problems tend to affect the vision quite late on, while the macular problem or, or the retinal problem tend to affect the visual acuity quite early on. Usually with the macular problem, you get what we call a distortion of vision. So patients come to you and say, my vision is distorted rather than uh, blurred. Um, the optic nerve problems usually cause what we call a, a, a negative scotoma. So patients complain that there is a missing part of their vision compared to uh, patients with macular problems where the, the vision is distorted and sometimes blurred, but not missing. That's, that's quite key and important to try to understand, especially in subtle cases. Color vision, we tend to use, there's lots of you know, ways of, of testing that. The, the, the one that we tend to use in Manchester is, is the Ishihara uh, chromatic plates. And, and again, to try to differentiate the optic nerve from the macular problems, optic nerve uh, diseases tend to affect the color vision quite early on compared to the retina problems. So it's the reverse compared to the visual acuity. Uh, peripheral vision and obviously anything that affects uh, the, the, the visual pathway can cause a field defect. But really trying to understand whether this is something happening because of a problem inside the eye itself, like you know patients who had laser or patients who had glaucoma or something like that, or is it a problem in the visual pathway neurologically? 
Uh, and and the, the key here is the shape of the visual field defect. So usually visual field defects related to neurological disease, especially if it's uh, chiasmal and beyond respects what we call the vertical midline. So you can see on these, these pictures uh, here, for example, this is a bitemporal hemianopia because of damage at the chiasm area. And you remember that the, the, the crossing fibers are the nasal fibers. So damaging these will cause, because of the lens inside the eye essentially, will cause a bitemporal hemianopia. While if you, if you go further back and you cut the, the track, for example, you will get, you will get a hemianopic field defect on the contralateral side of your, of your disease. Uh, and, and the further back you go, the more what we call congruent, the more accurate and similar the, the field defects become uh, until you reach the, the visual uh, cortex and the uh, occipital lobe. Um, and the last thing we, uh, I need to comment on on the visual functions is the RAPD or the relative afferent pupillary defect. And because the, the fibers and the, and the optic nerve, part of the fibers of the optic nerve control the pupil reaction. Um, and it's, it's, it's something that helps us as ophthalmologists quite a bit because majority of eye diseases wouldn't cause, unless it's really pretty severe, wouldn't cause an RAPD except the optic nerve Problem. So optic neuropathies are, are the prime cause of RAPD compared to any other cause of visual loss. And the way to test it is the swinging light uh, test. So what we tend to do, for example, in this, in this picture, you have the defect in the optic nerve in the, in the uh, right eye, let's say, and your left eye is normal. So you shine the light and this one, because it's defective, it, it, it constricts only to four millimeter. While if you shine the light on the other eye, it, it constricts, the pupil constricts to two millimeter. So when you start swinging from this one back to this one, what happens is the pupil will only react to four millimeter. So instead of being two, it will move to four. So you will see that paradoxically, it's dilating rather than constricting, although you're shining a light into it. So that, that helps understand the concept and it helps us understand whether it's, it's a, 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 an ocular disease or is it an optic neuropathy? Um, so as we said, the response of the optic nerve to acute injury is only swelling. And the key for us is try to differentiate uh, what's causing this swelling and figure out uh, whether we can do anything about it or not. And the questions that I'll pose uh, for you in, on the next few slides is to try to go through that. So a couple of pictures of, of quite obvious swelling. As you can see, for example, on this picture, uh, it's an OCT of the uh, left eye. You can see the nerve compared to the previous one that we saw when it was completely normal. You can't see even the shape of the optic nerve. It's all blurred. The vessels are what we call obscured. So they are disappearing and they're reappearing again. There's lots of hemorrhages, lots of exudates, and it looks pretty bad. And even on the cross section, you can see it's quite significantly raised compared to the surface of the retina. This is the end, the end outcome. So following all you know, the swelling that resolved and the, settle, the, the case has settled down and the optic nerve lo loses its fibers and it becomes atrophic and it, it dips down into what we call the red zone in the OCT scan. This is, this is a case that I saw probably six, seven years ago now. And it's, it's just, it highlights that sometimes it's quite difficult to really understand what's going on. I mean, if, if you look at the previous picture, uh, it was quite obvious, you can't really miss it. Once you look at the fundus, you can see it straight away. Well, well this one, the difficulty is to, to de decide, is this a true swelling or is it just something that's, that's not you know, of concern? <clears throat> so this is a 45 years old female who came to casualty and saying that her optician saw her and said, look, your optic nerves are swollen, go to the eye emergency clinic, they will see you there. And I looked at it and I thought, you know, there might be something, I'm not quite sure, it's difficult to tell. Uh, the, the margins looks a little bit raised, but it's not significantly swollen. There isn't anything really striking about it. Apart perhaps if you're really carefully looking, there might be a small hemorrhage there on the edge of the nerve. And that's what kind of prompted us to do further investigations. And she went on to have an a CT scan and an MRI scan, and this is what we found. So imagine she had this huge tumor at the back of her head, causing edema and causing all sorts of issues. 
but she was completely asymptomatic. She said, I went to my optician for a routine check for my glasses and I ended up with an operation in my head. So it's not as easy as it looks to be, to, to, to be completely honest with you guys. So the first question that I want to ask when I see these patients, is the optic nerve is truly swollen or is it just a normal variant? There isn't anything there to be concerned about and we can safely discharge that patient. So there is three common things that can simulate a true optic nerve swelling and that can cause what we call a pseudo optic nerve swelling. And you know, in fact, we get quite a few of these referrals from opticians in the community because of these uncertainties. Uh, they are relatively common. Um, they can cause a, an optic nerve to be raised, a little bit crowded, what we call, but they are not a true swelling. And these are the optic nerve drusen, which are essentially, as ophthalmologists know, they are uh, calcium deposits inside the structure of the optic nerve. They are sometimes buried deep down in the, in the structure of the optic nerve and you can't see them. So it, it becomes a little bit of a confusing picture. The crowded optic nerves are nerves that are small and in, in what we call a hypermetropic eye, so an eye that's long-sighted. And these tend to be a bit crowded and small, but there is no true swelling. And we'll, we'll talk about a couple of examples of these. Uh, tilted optic nerves are, are nerves that are, you know, if, if you remember the, the anatomy, the nerve doesn't come in these patients, doesn't come directly at a right angle to the back of the eye, but comes at a tilt. And with that, you get part of the nerve that's raised above the surface of the retina and can cause this confusion. So crowded optic nerves are, as we said, uh, small optic nerves. They are heaped or elevated, so they are a little bit higher than the surface of the retina, not significantly though. And there is no features of a true optic nerve swelling. Oh, no, no. Okay, she's crouching to read the sign. Yeah, she's crouching to read the sign. We so can't hear it. Yeah, so <clears throat> I got muted like everybody else. So the, uh, where were we? So the, the, there is no features of a true optic nerve swelling. And in, in the next couple of slides, we'll talk about the features of uh, the true swelling. Uh, in, in, in doubtful cases, what we tend to do here in Manchester is we request an ultrasound scan to the optic nerve. And that helps us differentiate true swelling from pseudo swelling, because true swelling will have some, some increased fluid cuff around the optic nerve. If you remember, there is, there is a CSF cuff around the optic nerve. And when there is uh, high pressure or swelling to the optic nerve, you get a bit more of that fluid. Drusen can be easily, can, can be identified on the ultrasound as well, because it, it's a highly reflective sort of uh, structure inside the optic nerve. Um, so this is an example of an optic nerve drusen. Uh, you can see that little spot there on the fundus and in the structure of the optic nerve, there's a bright sort of lesion inside the optic nerve. Uh, this patient has got referred from optician querying optic swelling, optic nerve swelling, but uh, following an ultrasound scan, we felt it's not, and uh, we just discharged the patient. Another one, a bit more obvious, you can see there's loads of these little tiny bright spots in the surface of the nerve, on the edge of the nerve, similarly in the other eye as well, and inside the optic nerve, uh, OCT scan, you can see these rounded sort of uh, bright spots or bright structures, highly reflective structures here and there. Uh, they, they, I have to admit the ultrasound is far more sensitive to picking up these compared to the uh, OCT scan. Uh, an example of uh, a crowded optic nerve, so, and with a bit of tilt actually. So you can see that the nerve is coming to the, to the back of the eye with an angle. So the temporal side of the retina is a little bit lower than the nasal side of the retina and the nerve is bulging into, some, into the retina itself without, without being completely flat. Uh, and similarly in the other eye, you might say that there is a hemorrhage there. And in fact, this is a 16 years old who was confused with a true swelling. And it's really confusing because there is a hemorrhage there and you'd feel that there might be a swelling. However, if you look carefully, there is a membrane on the toroid here and that has bled 
and cause a, 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 a possible swelling, but it's not a true swelling. It's not a neurological swelling, etc. Another example of crowding, uh, this is a hypermetropic patient with small optic nerves. There is no cup in the center and the optic nerve is a bit raised. So the feature that we will talk about, uh, so we, we, we mentioned the investigation that we tend to do. And the last one is usually the neuroimaging, uh, you know, um, which is obviously sometimes is needed. But the feature that we look at when we're assessing is it a true optic nerve swelling or not, is obviously you, you need to see as many as possible of normal optic nerves, normal OCTs to understand the normal variance because there is loads and loads of normal variance. You have to uh, try to understand if it's, crowded, if it's crowded or if it's tilted. But the features of an abnormal or a truly swollen optic nerves is, is these features. So you look at you look at these one by one. So the elevation, so the nerve is elevated above the surface of the retina, usually quite significantly, but sometimes in subtle cases, not necessarily. The second feature that we look at is the angle. So this, when we, when we focus, we focus on the, on the margin between the optic nerve and the retina. We look at this margin and the angle between the nerve that's raised and the surface of the retina. Is this angle kind of a sloping angle or is it a very sharp rise angle? If it's a sloping angle, that suggests that there is a true swelling because the swelling is not only on the surface of the nerve, but also extends to the surface of the retina. And that is highly suspicious of a, a, a true optic nerve swelling compared to a pseudo swelling. Uh, while in, in pseudo swelling, the, the surface of the retina is completely normal and you get a very sharp rise to the optic nerve and then down to the, the, the pit in the center. Uh, so that, that you know, hill versus mountain sort of shape can sometimes help differentiate the two. We also look at the same angle and we look at if there is any fluid uh, pockets in these, in these areas between the optic nerve and the retina. So for example, in this one, there is a couple of little cysts of fluid in the edge of the nerve and that suggests a true swelling. Some people say, uh, you need to look at what we call Brooks membrane. So Brooks membrane to the non ophthalmologist is the bottom layer here that's below the uh, retinal pigment epithelium. And the assumption is in true swelling, the Brooks membrane tend to uh, be bent upwards, while in pseudo swelling, it tend to be flat or bent downwards. I find this a little bit difficult to kind of understand and sometimes difficult to, to find. And I've seen so many patients who have true swelling yet for example, this one, uh, yet their Brooks membrane is flat or sometimes tilted down it, but nonetheless, it's, it's mentioned as, as a differentiating factor. We also look at if there is any hemorrhages. We look at the nerve fiber layer. As we said, we look at the assessment of the machine that tells you if this is a true swelling or not. It's not always accurate, so you have to take, but you have to take that into account as well. You look at what we call uh, obscuration of the blood vessels and we'll come in, in the next few slides to Friesen classification to the obscuration of the blood vessels. But essentially, it's a very sensitive sign to tell you whether the, the, the swelling is, is, is pseudo or a true swelling. I, what I've, I've always said is it's, it's always a piece of jigsaw. You can't really depend on one of these features on its own. You have to take into account the history of the patient. You have to take into account how he present or she presented, whether there is any symptoms or not and what are their visual functions, and then look at all these features in conjunction together, and then make your decision, does this warrant further investigation, or let's just assume it's a normal variance. So we've, we've established that it is a true optic nerve swelling. The next question for us as ophthalmologists to understand is, is it unilateral or bilateral? Because we, we need to, to, to do that because the, the, the the investigations pathway for unilateral optic nerve swelling is completely different from bilateral optic nerve swelling. The things that can cause unilateral optic nerve swelling need to be, you know, they're usually the ones that are in front of you on the screen, but they are completely different from what you'd look at when you're assessing a bilateral optic nerve swelling. So common things are common, uh, inflammatory optic neuropathies, infectious optic neuropathies, vascular optic neuropathies, compressive, infiltrative, and traumatic. Um, 
if we start with the inflammatory ones or what we tend to call as optic neuritis, there is two main uh, types of it. There is the typical or the myelinating optic neuritis and the atypical or the non-typical optic neuritis, which can be because of any other uh, inflammatory cause like sarcoid, for example, and we've had quite a few of these. Infectious, uh, direct infection to the optic nerve is quite rare. It's usually a para-infectious picture where the inflammation or the infection actually is, is in the sinuses around the optic nerve. But nonetheless, we've seen one that invade the orbit and cause direct uh, infectious optic neuropathy. Uh, vascular optic neuropathies are quite common. Uh, uh, you can get this in the context of what we call non-arthritic age-related uh, ischemic optic neuropathy or in the context more seriously, obviously in GCA or giant cell arthritis. Diabetics can, can have some swelling to the optic nerve, which is vascular in nature, but usually benign with no, with no uh, disruption to the visual functions. The other uh, features are quite rare, obviously. <coughs> so the inflammatory one or the optic neuritis, uh, the, the, the key here is because it's inflammatory, it's usually acute with some pain, but it's what we call a, a subacute presentation. It's not a very acute, hyperacute presentation. The patients complain of loss of vision that happened very, very quickly, but over a period of, of few hours to one or two days, rather than a sharp sudden onset loss of vision in, 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 in a second, essentially. And that, that helps us differentiate a vascular cause from an inflammatory cause. Uh, the typical ones uh, will, uh, the next slide will show that, uh, will, will have uh, some pain behind the eye when they present, loss of vision, loss of color vision, a field defect of some sort, and, and an RAPD, obviously, because it's an optic neuropathy. Uh, to investigate them, you will need uh, the standard stuff that we tend to do in Manchester is neuroimaging, MRI scan, and some blood tests looking for inflammatory causes, primarily if it's all typical. And ruling out uh, MS mimics like anti-MOG antibodies and anti-aquaporin-4 antibodies. And treatment is all based on the uh, ONTT trial, the optic nerve treatment trial. It's quite an old trial now, but still the gold standard for treatment, where if the loss is uh, 660... <coughs> So if the, if the visual loss is 660 or better, we tend not to treat. If it's below that, we tend to treat with a high dose of uh, IV steroids. So <clears throat> just for the uh, interest of, of, of people of non-ophthalmic background, perhaps, the typical features of optic neuritis are women uh, of, of young to middle age with some pain behind the eye, some reduction of vision up to what we call a hand movement level, the color vision, as you said, will be reduced. There will be field defects and an RIPD. There will probably be no optic nerve swelling or very little because it's mainly what we call retrobulbar. So it's in the orbit behind the globe rather than on the nerve, on the, on the nerve head itself. Usually we tend not to investigate them, but with an MRI scan and aquaporin-4, as we said. But if it's non-typical, if there is lots of other features, like you know, lots of pain, for example, or lots of swelling, then you'll have to do all sorts of other blood tests, essentially looking for infectious and autoimmune causes. So, you know, a very, very common presentation in the eye emergency clinic, to be honest with you. Young female, 35 years old, sudden loss of vision over a few days, some pain, vision reduced to hand movement, color vision is reduced. There is an RIPD diagnosed with a typical optic neuritis. There was no treatment, although her vision, I, I have a reservation on this because her vision was, was quite low and I would have probably counseled her about starting treatment, but she wasn't treated. Um, she had the uh, anti-MOG and aquaporin-4 antibodies and an MRI scan. Uh, usually the prognosis depends on the finding of the MRI scan, whether she is likely to develop MS in the future or not. And this is her optic nerve. Uh, you can see there is hardly any swelling. I mean, you can, with, with a bit of imagination, you can, can assume that the optic nerve here is a little bit blurred margin rather than completely sharp and clear, comparing to the other eyes usually helpful as well. Another example, you can see that, that the, the superior margin of the optic nerve here is a little bit blurred and hazy. The surface is a little bit elevated on top of the nerve, 
there might be some fluid there but this one looks a little bit better with no swelling so these are fairly typical of the United patients the atypical ones you can see this is a young man who's had significant optic nerve swelling the loss of vision was subacute as you'd expect in inflammatory causes but there was no pain and the fact that there was no pain is an atypical feature in itself looking at the fundus there was significant swelling there so he was investigated for uh, rarer causes and you know infectious and fine infectious causes and in fact this guy came to be uh, positive for syphilis. So he was referred to the gum clinic for treatment. Another example of syphilis, unfortunately, in Manchester, we have quite a few of these. Every one or two months, we get one of these cases where you have a significant swelling to the optic nerve, loss of function, so vision is reduced, there will be a field defect of some sort, and a, a, an RAPD compared to the other eye. The presentation is relatively typical of, of uh, subacute loss of vision, uh, usually without any pain. And you look at the fundus and you see this swelling. Uh, the, in these, as we said, we tend to do uh, autoimmune and infectious screen, uh, and he was positive for syphilis. He was treated under the gum clinic with uh, antibiotics and cover of steroids, and this is the outcome. And outcome, obviously, as we said, all optic nerves, if you have a significant swelling or a significant damage, will end up with uh, optic uh, pallor or optic atrophy. So he had a pale optic nerve with some, some gliosis in the surface. <clears throat> Another example, uh, a young female who had blurred vision in one eye down to what we call a 0 0.4, so about 6.15, so moderate loss of vision in the right eye relatively normal left eye. There was a subtle right relative afferent pupillary defect which told us that it's an optic neuropathy. Her investigations interestingly were normal, uh, but she was like this. So as you can see, it's, it's difficult really to miss this. She had a significant bilateral optic nerve swelling of great degree, probably about grade five on the horizon, which we will talk about later on. Uh, and it's in both eyes. I mentioned that her LP was normal. Uh, it was normal in terms of the opening pressure, but later on the testing showed some, some inflammatory cells and she was treated as a meningitis, uh, which ultimately resulted in pale optic nerves as you'd expect. So the swelling is gone. There is loss of the nerve fiber layer. It's all, it's all white in color and, and some vascular sheathing around the optic nerve. So that's inflammatory and infectious. Uh, the second common cause is vascular. And for us ophthalmologists, there is two things that you need to really differentiate. What's called non-arthritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy and arthritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Both of them affect elderly people. <coughs> Although GCA tends to be a bit older in presentation. Uh, the, 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 the key really is, is having a good clear history and looking at uh, investigations of uh, the inflammatory markers. So blood tests for ESR, CRP, through blood count, and the history of whether there is any, any pain, any tenderness on the temples, and all these things to try to differentiate. I have to say it's not always easy to do that. And there are cases where you take the safety route and you assume it's uh, GCA and treat them with steroids uh, to later on following investigations, you change your mind and you think it's more of a non-obstructive presentation. I, I think, I think that, you know, it's, it's to some extent a bit dangerous to assume it's non-obstructive because we've, we've been bitten quite a few times actually uh, when people assume that it's a non-obstructive anterior ischemic optic neuropathy to be found later as a GCA. Uh, and the problem with GCA, obviously, as you all know, uh, the, the, the loss of vision is permanent and profound and can sometimes affect both eyes in quick succession. So it's really a, a, a true ophthalmic emergency. Uh, uh, you all know what we tend to do for these patients. So uh, we, we look at obviously their age and whether there is any symptoms to suggest GCA, uh, the blood tests for ESR, CRP and flu blood count to, to figure out if there is any inflammatory cause or not. The gold standard is the temporal artery biopsy. But recently, and I say recently, probably over the last couple of years, we've been doing temporal artery ultrasound to try to relieve 
the burden of doing uh, biopsies for everybody. Uh, the approach in Manchester, at least at the moment, is we do the ultrasound for all suspicious cases. If it's positive, you know, i.e. there is a halo around the temporal artery, then we tend to accept that and don't do the, the, the biopsy. If it's negative, we still do the biopsy just to, as, a, as the gold standard. Obviously, if you think it's GCA, then the treatment is with high dose of steroids for a very long period of time. Usually end up with, with uh, our rheumatologists colleagues to look after them for, for long term. So <clears throat> a couple of, you know, um, relatively, again, typical examples, an elderly patient, sudden loss of vision, profound down to hand movement in his right eye, a little bit of pain. It's not really kind of uh, that you'd, you'd feel it's, it's significant. However, when, when he had the inflammatory markers, his, his ESR and CRP were raised, his platelets were above 400. So he was admitted for uh, IV methyl PRED and followed by a temporal artery biopsy and the typical referral to rheumatology. Uh, this is how it was. And you can, you can see how, uh, this, is, this is an anarthritic one. Uh, you can see sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference because the swelling is relatively similar. Although people assume that the arthritic uh, or GCA related optic neuropathy tend to have a white, white chalky white uh, swelling to the optic nerve with lots of ischemia. It's sometimes really difficult to differentiate the two. But other features like, I always say to, to our trainees, look at the other eye. It's, it's really a key thing to look at whether the other eye is what we call a disc at risk or a clouded optic nerve because the non-arthritic type of optic neuropathy is, is exceedingly rare in, in non-crowded optic nerve. It can happen, we've seen a few, but you know, out of a out of hundred, you can probably get one or two that are happening in non-crowded optic nerves compared to the crowded or discrete risk patients. Another example, and again, you get the swelling here. The other eye is the crowded small disc, while this one, you can see the swelling, the nasal margin is completely swollen, the vessels are, are tortuous, and you can see there is fluid there. You see the Brooks membrane here, so it's raised upwards. And the optic nerve itself is raised above the surface of the retina significantly compared to the other arm. So it is a crowded nerve to start with, but there is a true swelling on top of that that's causing the difference and causing the, the, the Myers to go into the wrong as well. So we talked about, is it true or, or pseudo? We talked about if it's unilateral or bilateral, and we, we talked about the causes of a unilateral swelling. Now, when you see a bilateral optic nerve swelling, the next question for us to understand, is it a true bilateral optic nerve swelling, or is it simply a sequential? And I've seen quite a few of these patients. In fact, you know, recently we saw a patient who is, she's, she's in her 70s and she had bilateral optic nerve swelling. And people assume this is bilateral, let's investigate it at that. She turned out to be a GCA patient who had a unilateral swelling about a week ago, never been seen because we didn't, she didn't really bother, wanted to bother anybody with her loss of vision. She said it would go away on its own. She wasn't in significant pain or anything. Uh, and then a few days later, the other eye swell and the other eye lost vision. And then she presented to the eye emergency clinic. So she had a sequential loss of vision. And when she was seen, she had a florid bilateral swelling to the optic nerve. But you need to remember, this is not a true bilateral. This is a sequential unilateral. And the investigations are exactly the same as you do for a unilateral swollen optic nerve. While the true bilateral swollen optic nerves are these. So, you know, we, we as we said, we differentiate a true bilateral from a sequential. And then there's two possibilities here. It's either a malignant hypertension. Usually you see lots of changes on the fundus, but not necessarily all the time. Usually you can easily pick it up once you check the patient's blood pressure. If the blood pressure is normal, then you start to think of raising to turn the pressure. And you think, and I stress on the, on the word think, it could be papilledema. People need to remember, and we get this quite a lot from referrals from our optician colleagues, that papilledema is a diagnosis. When you say to me, a patient has got papilledema, that means you've already tested their intracranial pressure and you know it's high. To label any swollen optic nerve as papilledema is pretty dangerous. And in fact, it's completely wrong. 
staphylidema is a diagnosis. It means that you've tested the intracranial pressure, and you know it's high. So, but in, in these cases, you, you, you think, you're assuming it's staphylidema, you still don't have that information yet. So, causes of a true optic nerve swelling that is bilateral from raising to plant pressure, top of your list, obviously, is the idiopathic one. But it's a differential of elimination, uh, a diagnosis of elimination. So, you, you, you think it is, but you have to rule out all other possibilities. So, we, we go through history and we ask patients about lots of medications like these ones, vitamin A. You'd be surprised how many patients take vitamin A supplements or even use uh, skin creams for acne that has vitamin A in it and tend to present to the eye emergency clinic with swollen optic nerves from raising to cranial pressure. Tetracycline is another example. Contraception is a risk factor. There is some suggestion that it's, it's, it's linked, but it's, it's a weaker sort of uh, evidence. Uh, medical condi conditions, uh, Kidney failure is top of your list. Addison disease is another one. Um, but primarily what you're looking at is if, if there is anything inside the brain. So brain tumors and sinus thrombosis. And that's why these patients, first thing you, you do is you send them straight for, for neuroimaging. So they, you need a, a CT or MRI scan, depending on your local arrangements. You need a venogram of some sort, either a CT venogram or MR venogram. And then you need a lumbar puncture to check for the pressure. So the idiopathic ones, the, the general features of the phenotype of these patients is, is usually fairly typical. You get it in, in, in young women who's uh, in, in, in young to middle age with uh, raised BMI. So they are overweight slash obese. These are the typical features. They complain of headaches. They complain of pulse synchronous tinnitus. It's, it's really key here, again, the history, and I, I can't really stress the importance of taking history in your ophthalmology because you, know, you ask any patient, do you have headaches? All of them will say to you, yes, I do have headaches. I have headaches. It's really quantifying that headache and understanding what type of headaches you're talking about. Is it migraine? Is it uh, tension headaches? Is it something that you'd link with raised intracranial pressure or not? And tinnitus, again, patients would say to you, yes, my ear rings all the time. But it's, it's pulse synchronous. It's, it's hearing your heart pounding in your ear rather than just any tinnitus. Obviously, the other features, you see the papilledema, which is usually, and I again stress on usually bilateral, usually symmetrical, but not always. We, we've seen so many patients who have very asymmetric uh, optic nerve swelling in papilledema. We don't really understand why, but it happens. We've seen strictly unilateral swollen optic nerves in papilledema patients or confirmed raised intracranial pressure. So it's, it's very unusual to be unilateral. Uh, not that unusual to be asymmetric, but it can be. So we have to be careful about that. Uh, now it's time to talk about, the, so the investigations, as you said, CT, CT venogram, and followed by lumbar puncture. And then the treatment really is around, uh, either you monitor them without any treatment or medical treatment, usually acetazolamide or surgical treatment which is usually either a shunt or, or optic nerve fenestration. So what is Ryzen grading? We've been talking about this for, for a while now. Ryzen, Ryzen graded the papilledema into five stages. Stage zero, when you don't have any swelling at all, completely normal, flat optic nerve. Uh, Ryzen one is when you have a swelling to the optic nerve where all the margins are blurred, you can't see the margins apart from the temporal margin. You need to remember the swelling happens usually the superior and inferior and the nasal before the temporal gets swelling. So in this one, you get this C-shaped cup or halo around the optic nerve sparing the temporal gap. So that, that's grade one. This is relatively mild, probably doesn't need any treatment. Grade two is a step further. So you get it at 360 degrees. So even the, the temporal margin now is a bit smaller. So the margin, as you can see, it's all blurred. You can't see it, but you still don't have what you call obscuration. <coughs> so on grade three, the obscuration happens. So the obscuration means that the vessels are, are not seen in part of their tract. So you can see this vessel, for example, and then it disappears here and then reappears here. So that suggests a true swelling of grade three. And that, that, that's 
so, so grade three and above are the ones that you get really concerned about. You don't want to lose them. You don't want to, because the optic nerve cannot tolerate this amount of pressure for long. They have to be a little bit hasty in, in what you do next. So in the obscuration here, you, you lose the major blood vessels as they leave the optic nerve. While in grade four, you lose the major blood vessels on top of the nerve itself. So as you can see in this example, and we have, I'll show you a picture of a very similar patient to this that I saw last week, uh, with, with grade four, where the vessels are obscured on the surface of the nerve itself rather than just on the edge of the nerve. And grade five is the worst, is when all the vessels now are obscured. You can't see any vessel. It's just a lump of white blob on the surface of the nerve, suggestive of very, very grave prognosis for this patient. It is likely these patients tend to lose quite a bit of their visual functions. So features of uh, IIH, you can't diagnose it unless you have these. So you, you, although there is, there is a rare occurrence where people say it's IIH without uh, papilledema, but it's, it's a controversial area, I have to say. Um, but papilledema is a feature. Neurological examination is completely normal, except, except uh, cranial nerve palsy sometimes, where you get a fourth or a sixth, or sometimes a seventh nerve palsy. Um, normal MRI scan, but there are features that can suggest radio intracranial pressure. I have to say these are all very non-specific, but they can, they can suggest that. And obviously following a CSF lumbar puncture, uh, the CSF constituents are normal, but the opening pressure is about 25 centimeters of aorta. <clears throat> and these are some of the medical conditions that you need to ask your patient about when you suspect raising to cranial pressure before saying it's just, you know, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And the key ones, as you said, you know, kidney failure is one. Uh, medications, as we said, vitamin A is up there. And sinus thrombosis obviously is a critical one that you need to investigate by doing a uh, venal crime of some sort. However, still, despite all that, it's a very difficult diagnosis because it involves lots of investigations. Some, some of them is, is invasive. Obviously, you're doing a lumbar puncture. And the ultimate treatment is obviously weight loss, um, but it's not that easy. I mean, you can try to convince your patient to lose weight, but it's not that easy all the time. And you get these patients waxing and waning, losing some weight, and then gaining it back again. It's also, uh, pregnancy is a difficult period because you can't treat them with anything and they put on weight. Headaches are very refractory. Problem with headaches is no matter what you do, majority of them will end up with chronic migraines. So despite that, you've sorted their pressure out, they're still complaining of headaches. And obviously there is lots of side effects from the medications. Uh, so this is an example, very, very typical, as we said before, 19 years old, some headaches, seen optician, swollen optic nerve, sent to the eye emergency clinic, bilateral swelling sent to the medics. Uh, she had a normal CT, CT venogram, lumbar puncture with raised intracranial pressure, IIH diagnosis, and this is her pictures. So as you see, uh, the typical features, uh, sloping angle, as we said, raised significantly on top of the nerve, of the retina, uh, possible some fluid there, certainly some fluid there, um, obscured one or two vessels. So this one is obscured here. This one, to some extent, is obscured here. The margin is 360 blurred, you can't see it. So this is, I'd say probably this is grade three around both eyes. This is a very good paper. It's probably about a year and a bit old now, where they, the guys in Birmingham reviewed uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension and tried to put some, some guidelines on management. And as a summary from their paper, it's, it's, uh, you find your papilledema or you identify your swollen optic nerves, uh, you assess the functions, you send for neuroimaging, you do a lumbar puncture, and then you rule out you know, secondary causes, as you said, and then you decide, is it typical? You know, BMI is raised in a female of the right age, or is it atypical, the phenotype doesn't fit, or is it what we call a fulminant idiopathic intracranial hypertension? These are the ones that are really, really nasty that you have to be very, very careful and quick in acting on them because the swelling is bad and they lose function quite, quite quickly. And again, from their paper, weight management is the key. Uh, and then obviously on this side of things where you have 
a 12 minute time, you're, you're, you're gonna do a couple of lumbar punctures or put a temporizing lumbar drain to, to get, to buy you some time before you do a surgical intervention. Usually, again, it depends on the local uh, arrangements. Here in Manchester, we tend to do quite a bit of, of a CSF diversion. So uh, BD shunting, other places would do uh, optic nerve fenestration, other places would do uh, sinus uh, stenting, for example. But it all depends on what, what's available locally, essentially. So this is the patient that I saw last week. And what's interesting to her uh, in her, she presented with the eye emergency clinic in July with, uh, it's not very clear on the picture, but you can see there is a true swelling there. It's raised on surface, it's sloping, as you said, there is lots of fluid pockets. It's all in the white, so it's significantly swollen. Uh, the picture is very small, but it, it was about grade three and similar appearance in the other eye. So the typical features, she had a CT venogram that was normal. She had a lump puncture pressure, I think was about 40. She was put on, on a gram of Dalmox and she was told she'll, she'll get an appointment with us uh, in about three to four weeks time, which is, which is acceptable given that she's about grade three. So she came last week to my clinic and this is how she was. She was very compliant with her treatment, she said. However, you can see the swelling has got a lot worse now, this, the, the, even the scan can't really see the top of the, of the swelling. It's, it's bent quite significantly over, still sloping, but this is now, you'd say, at least grade four, bordering on grade five. So the vessels are all obscured, even on the surface of the nerve. Most of them, but not all of them, perhaps. So there is one or two that are still very, uh, 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 visible. So this is grade four to five and a similar appearance in the other eye. This is probably grade five now, you can see there. So now this is turning, and despite that she's, she's on treatment, now this is turning to be a fulminant idiopathic intracranial hypertension. There is a significant risk of loss of function in these patients, and they have to be act very, very quickly on her. In fact, we decided, you know, I discussed it with her and whether she wants to continue on the medical treatment with increasing the dose or, or going for surgery straight away. And we opted for a very close monitoring. So we doubled the dose. She was on gram of Dalmox. We, we decided to give her two grams of Dalmox for a week. And if there was no improvement, she'd go for shunting. In fact, she presented over the weekend with you know, worsening of her symptoms. So she was admitted and she's awaiting intervention over the next couple of days or something, hopefully. Uh, the, 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 the thing that brought all this to light, actually, you know, the, the, all the swelling of the optic nerves and stuff was a case code that most of our optometrist colleagues would remember a few years ago when an optometrist was sent to jail because of missing an, a, a swollen optic nerve. And although the case was reversed later on, it still kind of prompted quite a bit of uh, flurry of, of referrals to the eye hospital, all the eye units everywhere, in fact, uh, to try to you know, mitigate all these suspicious swollen optic nerves. The majority of our referrals these days would say, you know, I suspect there is a swelling to the optic nerve. Could you please assess and decide what to do next? You know, opticians and optometrists you know, understandably don't want to take any responsibility for this. Anymore. So what do we do here in Manchester? You know, apart from the Golgi Cook that we tend to, I've been talking about all day long now, um, we try to uh, address this problem by, by kind of doing a one, one shop stop clinic. So everything is done in one go. Uh, now, obviously COVID has thrown that you know, into, into the wind again, but before COVID we had a clinic every week where patients be referred for suspicious optic nerves they get their vision, their color vision, their, their visual fields, and their OCT scan on the day. All the results are assessed by our fellows. Then they will have an ultrasound scan in the same clinic. And then a discussion was made to differentiate, is it arterial swelling or not? Is it unilateral or bilateral? And what to do next? And to arrange the appropriate referrals or discharge. So a couple of more pictures before we wrap up. I think last couple of minutes, um, that, that would be enough. So again, significant swelling, as you see, can see on the picture, all the margins are obscured, uh, some obscuration of the blood vessels. This is a clear example of the fluid pocket that I mentioned to you before. It's raised on the surface of the retina. 
and it's a sloping angle as we said. And another one, again, the swelling here is about grade one perhaps. So you can see that the temporal margin is still clear. Temporal margin is still clear. Yet there is a bit of fluid there. And again, similar picture. We've seen this before, about grade two to grade three, where all the margin is not clear, some explosion of the major blood vessels. And similarly on the other side. You see some fluid there. Remember I talked about the Brooks membrane rule. I don't really you know, want it to be honest with you because here it's it's bending down, yet there is a definite swelling here. So it's my opinion. And again, another one with grade one swelling, and there is no swelling in this one. So this is an example of, of this patient was with a true papilledema patient, but the swelling was, you can say it's unilateral or at best asymmetric. This one is swollen, probably grade one, and this one is not swollen at all. It's not always something that we'd see. And the hope is, you know, most of us, uh, of us are trainees and our practitioners wouldn't miss something like this because it's, it's not you know, something that you can just keep on missing at all. The grade one is swollen, as you can see. So, Really the take home message for me is, is history is really, really important in your ophthalmology. You really need to drill all the details from the patient. They wouldn't volunteer anything to you. You have to ask about all the details that you think are relevant and note it all down and, and, and question every single bit of, you know, it's not simply, it's not good enough to just to say a patient has headaches. What type of headaches, what type of, of presentation, how it presents, when it does go and you know, all these things. Similarly to the loss of vision, People come to me and say, well, patient has lost vision. When, how, how acute, painless, painful, all these things. And when you look at the optic nerve, we look at the size, as you said, we look at the margins, we look at the color of the optic nerve, we look at the center cup, uh, and we assess the functions, we assess the OCT features, and then when in doubt, you know, phone a friend. Thank you. And happy to answer. I, I didn't have the chance to look at the chat. If there is any questions, I'm happy to answer that as well. Um, let's see if Sonny is around still. Thanks, Jessica, and that, was, um, that was great. Uh, there's a couple of questions that have come in through the chat. Um, if people want to take this opportunity to unmute their microphones and ask the questions. Yeah, happy. Uh, hello, Mr. Yegen. Hi. Um, I have one small question uh, regarding giant cell arthritis, yep. where uh, we test the ASR as well as the ICRP. Uh, now, there Obviously, usually on a Friday night, they are usually borderline. Uh, what, what would you look more at? Is it the CRP, perhaps, or the ASR? Uh, Very good question, Hassan. Thank you. Uh, I think both of them are important. Uh, the, the, the textbook says ESR for some reason, although the CRP is the more acute one, and that tends to be a bit more sensitive, in my opinion. Um, I'd, I'd tolerate a bit of raised ESR with the normal CRP. If, it, if the CRP is, is high, I'd, I'd be a bit more twitchy about it. But it's all you know, taking it into context and if there is anything else going on, uh, the whole picture, as you said. Thank you. And you're muted, you can't hear you. Sorry, I was on mute there. Yeah. Uh, a question regarding uh, performing optic nerve fenestration and, uh, sorry, in IIH and what are the results? Um, it, it really depends on your local arrangements. Unfortunately, here in Manchester, I, I know that Sheffield, for example, uh, have have a very good large service of optic nerve fenestrations and they, their results are quite impressive. Uh, they've published and presented several times, but here in Manchester, we have rather limited experience uh, with a mixed bag. I, I think we, over the last five years, perhaps we have done a handful of patients. Uh, majority of them were okay. In fact, recently, a few months ago, we did one 
and her vision improved and the swelling gone away. But in, in my mind, the, the approach, it depends on what you have locally and it depends whether you do them, you know, sequentially or you do them together and how, how urgent you are. For example, the patient that I've, I'm involved with recently, although neurosurgeons are, are keen on, on having her to have a fenestration, I think it's probably going to be difficult for us to do that because one, you need to, at least here in Manchester, we fenestrate sequentially. We don't do them together. So you're going to lose time before you do her second eye. And also doing the fenestration, you don't know how quick the optic nerve pressure will go down. While in my you know, understanding, a VP, VP, VP shunt will, will cause a quicker response to both optic nerves at the same time. So, you know, but ultimately, I think whatever arrangements you have locally. Very good. Um, another question regarding IH and papilledema. How frequently do you follow the patient and on what basis? Um, it, it, it all depends on the amount of swelling. I think, I think the risk of loss of function is the, the drive for you to, to, to arrange the follow-ups. The, the typical ones, when you have grade one, grade two swelling, and they are on treatment, usually we see them every six to eight weeks to start with, and then we expand, extend that gradually over time. Um, the ones that, like the one that you, you have just presented recently, we, we see them every week until the swelling goes down to a grade two and or below, and then you can calm down and, and extend. I think, I think you have to be very, very careful with significantly swollen optic nerve. You can't use it for long uh, before you make, you, you make a move. Okay. Um, Chris Douglas has asked, if a pregnant lady had papilledema with a normal MRV, what would be your optimal management, optic nerve fenestration or shunting? Uh, <laughs> pregnancy, I think, is a is, is really difficult one. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about whether, whether whether neurosurgeons would be happy to shunt a pregnant patient. Depends again. It depends on how much pregnant she is and you know where in her pregnancy she is. Uh, we've we've managed patients with with serial lumbar punctures during pregnancy. We've managed patients with acetazolamide if they are in the second trimester and beyond. Again, depends on the amount of swelling. I think ultimately patient's decision would play a role and you can you can you can discuss with the patient whether they're prepared because optic nerve fenestration is not risk free i have to say that there is a well documented low risk of complete loss of vision following fenestration so you know you're 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 trying to save vision that you can wipe out during the surgery completely so you have to be very very careful with that and there are patients who we've cancelled and they said, no, you're not touching the back of my eye, no matter what. I'm prepared to go for a shunt, but I'm not going through administration. Certainly if you tell them that you're going to have it to both eyes. Now, if you had IIH, would you prefer a shunt or optic nerve fenestration? <laughs> um, I'd go for a shunt. I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to tell, but I'd, I'd, I'd feel a bit more comfortable not touching the back of my eye. I think the neurosurgeons would probably say they'd rather. I know. Have... Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, I think that neurosurgeons would say the exact opposite. And in fact, the discussion about this particular patient that we're doing last week is neurosurgeons want her to be shunt, uh, fenestrated and we want her to be shunted. Um, it's not you're pushing something you know away from you to the other person to do, but it's it's we understand the risks of of what we do and you understand the risk of what you do and you kind of treat try to do the best for the patient, but it's sometimes a bit difficult to be honest with you to, to figure out what's right and what's wrong. I think both options are valid, and that's where patient's choice can, can play a role, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Patient choice and also what's available. <laughs> and what's available. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if anyone wants to unmute and ask any questions. Yeah, thanks, Ali. I'm one of the neurologists at Salford Royal. Just wanted to ask the prognosis in optic neuritis. Hi. Um, if it's uh, normal MRI head scan, normal blood tests, how long do you expect the patients to go back to normal vision? Because uh, I have seen few patients few months down the line and they're not still back to normal. 
Okay. Um, so in, in typical optic neuritis, the demyelinating type, you know, when you get this, this clinically isolated syndrome type presentation with a normal MRI scan, the, the, the majority of them, about 90% of them would recover near full vision in about six months. Uh, they would always say to you, though, that my vision is not back to normal. They will always feel, you know, you test them on the chart. The problem with the charts that you test with, it's a very high contrast chart. It's not day daylight. So it's not like what you'd expect in, in normal, you know, living conditions. Uh, you test them on the, on the chart and they'd say 6-6 six, six vision, but in normal life, they're not as good. So they'll always complain of my vision in that eye is not as good as it used to be. Their color vision will always be defective. Their, their contrast sensitivity will always be defective. So, you know, six months is usual work for the recovery. Majority of them do recover a lot quicker than six months, but we've seen patients who go to up to six months. Old. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. A uh, question that's come to me via email. How long does it take to typically develop uh, papilledema and then progress through the stages? Um, and how long does it take to normalize after treatment? Um, I don't think there is a scale for how long for the papilledema to develop. I think it all depends on how much intracranial pressure you have. And if, if it's slight rise, then you'd expect the papilledema to take months and months to develop properly. The usual, the usual referral pattern that we see from our opticians is, or from our patients, patients would say to you, I've been having headaches for the last couple of years and I've, I've seen my GP and they said it's sinusitis and they said it's, it's migraines. And then ultimately, you know, a year later, I saw my optician who saw the swelling. So you wonder whether all that was, was you know, raised into cranial pressure that was grumbling and building up gradually. Um, so it, it really depends on how much pressure behind it, whether the, the, the pressure is sharp and you know, acutely raised or was it, whether it's a gradual grumbling sort of building up because patient is getting overweight or obese and things like that. The reverse is, is a bit more predictable. The reverse is when, when you normalize intracranial pressure and there is no confounding factors, the swelling of the optic nerve usually resolves within, within six to eight weeks. You'd expect the optic nerve to go back to more or less normal in about two months time if there isn't anything else going on. Uh, and then there's a question regarding your steroid regime in optic neuritis. So it says here on the chat that the steroid regime, it is the ONTT, uh, as, as mentioned by uh, the question. Uh, but it, what we tend to do is three doses rather than five doses of IV methylpred. We give three doses of IV methylpred, one gram a day, and then followed by 10 days of oral uh, 60 milligrams of prednisolone. Um, recently, because of the COVID and the lack of beds and all the rest of things, and I think majority of our neurology colleagues, and Dr. Mofak might, might agree with me on that, is we, they, they tend to give uh, oral uh, methylpred, 500 milligrams for five days and then stop. And we found that it's, it's probably similar in effect. I think the key here is not to give oral prednisolone in optic neuritis. You can give methylpred whichever way you prefer. If you have the access to IV, then go for IV. If not, give oral uh, methylpred. Any more questions? I think we've gone through all the questions. Thank okay. you very much for your Thank time. you. Thank you again for the invite. And I'm you know, really pleased with this. It would be great if you could follow up with another talk, no pressure. Happy to. Let me know when and, and I'm happy to. I think if, if we decide to do that, I'll probably talk about the, the afferent pathway and talk about ocular motility to some extent. But whenever you're, let me know. Great. Thank you. I'll end the meeting there.